musicians in bars getting beer. And it's me, Billy C. at Castro's on Queen Street in the beach. Look who's in time. It's all there. From Drug Carbon. Look at that t shirt. Gotta love it. Hi, Will. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Happy. Nice t shirt. One of, a, one of a kind. Is it? It's one of a kind. Yeah, my, uh, my, one of my big sisters made it for me for my birthday. So. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Hand painted? You know what? I, no, it looks like uh, that was ironed on or something. Um, I don't know how she did. I haven't talked to her about it yet. Yeah, cool. I only just got it. So. Yeah. I'm trying to encourage this big demand for merchandise for drug farming. So hopefully everybody watches this and we'll be clamoring for t-shirts. So that's that's the idea. Sounds great. Yeah. So speaking of drug farming, um, new album, Second Sound. Yes. What are your thoughts? Um, what are my thoughts? All five of us love the album, which is in stark contrast to the first album. I think Phil and I were the only two guys who liked that first record. Um, Troy, Ed, Peter to a lesser extent, didn't seem happy about it and we're, we're surprised when uh, it kind of gained some popularity. But this album, everybody is excited about it, everybody's happy, it's on the, on the same page, which is kind of weird, you know. Yeah. So the sales blasted off. Sales are great. Yeah. Sales are far better than the first record, and the first record is selling better than it has in in over a year. So because of the popularity, of the I guess so. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, th things are things are exciting. Things are good. So tell us about your funnest, wildest, whatever, uh, drug farming gig. Oh, funnest, wildest drug farming gig. Your I, choice. Any yeah, yeah. Uh, well, t two two come to mind. Um, you can almost say three. Last summer we tried to do two outdoor gigs, one at the CNE and one at uh, an Etobicoke, Etobicoke uh, some, a Mardi Gras of some sort. Torrential rain, both of those gigs. So uh, CNE, I think we played five songs. Was that, that? Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. So you know. Uh, so they're memorable for that. But um, a couple of, couple of years ago, I'm going to say two and a half years ago, we opened for um, Tony Levin and the Stickmen. Yeah, at uh, Lee's Palace. So that was that was really exciting. Um, one of the, f yeah, one of one of the first real kind of shows we played at a good venue with good sound, playing our material. We had a good stage set up. There's pictures of it where all five of us were lined up across the stage. Myself on the stage right, Troy way on the other side. So it looked really cool and. Uh, Tony Levin, Pat Mastelato were really personable, easy guys to talk to, so that that really made the made it a memorable gig for sure. So that would that would be the one that stands That's awesome. out. Yeah. It's a nice credit. Mm-hmm. Open for Tony Levine. Yeah, yes. Levin. We all know him. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, Oh, so we're at Castro's. What are we drinking here? Yeah, Anyways. we're at Castro's Lounge in the beach, one of my favorite places to go. And we're drinking Hackershore Weiss. Um, great. German Weiss beer, or wheat beer, I suppose we prefer, and I enjoy those on a summer day. Normally when I come here, though, I normally get Delirium Tremens, Belgian beer, but if I had two of those over the course of the interview, I would, uh, I would not be very coherent by the end of the interview, <laughs> so um, I'm playing it safe with the Hacker today. Um, so now that we've done some product placement Absolutely. for the beer company, do you have any endorsements that you'd like to talk about? I have no endorsements. I, I am, uh, I am uh, behind the curve that way. Um, I, I got, in, got into the game a lot later than the other guys in the band, than, than Troy or Peter or Phil. So, What, do you want to talk about your, uh, your music teaching? Well, um, in, in terms of my own education or my own... Uh, or promote your... Uh, yeah, I've, I've been teaching just uh, my own practice. I go to people's homes. Been doing that for about 15 years. Um, uh, it's just a, it's just a way to just a way to kind of pay the bills. But um, is that conservatory? Yeah, I, I like I was taught conservatory, um, so I, I tend to teach the same way, prepare people for those exams. But um, there's also some adult students I have, and I, I teach them what they specifically want to learn: um, rock music. Um, 30s, 40s, kind of uh, um, jazz standards, if that's what they want to learn. So, but uh, yeah, mainly conservatory. It's worked for me, so I I teach it. So other than the uh, other than the uh, drug farming um, project, you're uh, also famous for classic albums live. Extremely famous. That's yes. yes, that's the word. So you've done over 30. I've done I've done 
33, 34, 35 records. I would have to do another head count again. Wow. Um, Fav uh, favorite ones? <sighs> well, I, I, every time I get that question, wish you were here, Pink Floyd, comes oh. up a lot. Yeah. Um, when you play that album straight through, it's really two big songs, right? Because the songs fade from one to the other. So the only break you get is at the end of side one. And, and it ranges from atmospheric, huge keyboards, um, really nice kind of Moog solos like you'd have in Shine On Part 6. We, uh, Welcome to the Machine has some good screaming lead lines in it. Lots of sound effects. So just, you're, you're kind of involved and busy all night long. And I, I like Rick Wright as a player a lot. I kind of relate to what he does. So that would be up there. Um, Crime of the Century is, is high on my list. We just did a, a series of um, Elton John's Greatest Hits Volume 1, though. So, obviously, that was a lot of fun to play. I, I listened to Elton John a lot as a kid, so he, he's a he is an influence on me too. Very inspirational for a piano player. Absolutely, absolutely, good stuff. And uh, we we got to play on that show in the second set, "Funeral for a Friend," which is you know Elton's proggiest tune. I think you'd agree. And that that was just a pleasure to hear it played properly. So, yeah. and uh, what about? Um Wildest time on classic album five. Oh boy! I, I, you know what? We um, we're all we're all older musicians. Some of us are married. It, it, <laughs> if, if you go backstage at a classic albums live show, expecting any you know, the hookers with blow and all that <laughs> stuff, you're not going to get anything like that. It's um, yeah. I would I'd have to I'd need a half hour to come up with something halfway entertaining. It's 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 pretty tame. What can I tell you? Very professional. Though, that's suppose, it. Yes, right? that's what it is. Professional. That's the word. Not tame. Professional. Everybody's well behaved. Every exactly. Good yes. for you. Good for you. Well, that goes back to classical training, the Bach and Rachmaninoff. But uh, let's go back not quite as far as the classical side of uh, William Hare. Let's go back to uh, oh, let's say Abraham's children. Abraham's children. Yes. You know what? I, I gotta think about even what year that was. I'm, I'm thinking like 03, 04, something like that. Abraham's Children, for those of you not in the know, um, were a band, Canadian band, fronted by uh, Jimmy Bertucci, who is a, I still consider a, a good friend of mine. He's in LA these days. Um, they're around from 70 to 72. Uh, they would even call themselves kind of bubblegum pop. They had a, a couple of hits, Goodbye, Farewell. Um, Goddess of Nature, but Gypsy is a song that still gets some AM radio play. Maybe some of you out there remember that song or still hear it. And uh, Jimmy was putting the, the band back together and uh, just through the grapevine, um, I got asked to um, audition for it. Actually, the drummer, Mike von Steinberg, was going out with my ex-girlfriend. So that, that was the connection. I said, oh, why don't you ask Will? He's a keyboard player. And uh, oddly enough, is I think the only situation where I really had to audition for a position. So that was kind of cool, you know, learning the tunes, some of which I really liked. And uh, got the gig. We did four or five gigs, but it, it, never, really, it never really took off. But it was, it was a good experience, you know. I enjoyed it. You know, good classic rock, some of that stuff. So... Um, Interesting playing someone else's original tunes, you know, just enhances your own kind of experience. Yeah, but look them up, uh, Abraham's Children. They have a website. Maybe have a listen and see what you think. Want to do any other name dropping? Or? Is, is that does that constitute name dropping? Uh, a little bit with uh, Bertucci. Oh, Jimmy Bertucci. I'm trying, trying to think who else is is in that circle. Um, no, that would that would be it. He he. The thing he might be known for now. There's an Italian Walk of Fame on College Street, uh, I guess by the Chin Building, mm -hmm. and he's, he's more or less responsible for starting that, so uh, there you go, that's something, and uh, yeah, that's, that's all I got for that, for that tale, that's, that's going back a ways, yeah. That's cool. Uh -huh. um, what about any other uh, associations from the past? Um, well, let's just keep the Italian theme going with, with Jimmy Pertucci, uh, Angelica De Castro. Is, is someone that comes up because that's actually how I met Ed Bernard. Angelica De Castro is a, uh, let's just say, adult contemporary pop singer, um, operatically trained, really, really wonderful singer. And uh, she, I 
again, I'd have to think about how I got involved with her. Her producer was someone named Peter Lindsman, and I had done some work with him. And that's how I met Ed Bernard. He'd also been doing some work with him. So at the first audition, not audition, actually, uh, rehearsal to do her CD release, I meet Ed Bernard, and Prague comes up. Um, we end up going out for a beer, and uh, it was one of those things, uh, we, should, we should hook up, you know, and we should do something together. And again, like those things, maybe a year passed before anything ever happened, but, you know, both of us taking this gig that maybe really wasn't like our true musical experience, it ended up leading, in a way, it really ended up leading to, to drug farming. You know. around 2004, five, Oh, that's a good question. I would say five, yeah. five, or, five or six, yeah. I got that from your website. Um, yeah. So that's where it all started with Drug Farm, and you and Ed? Well, no, it started with Ed and Troy, because um, Ed and Troy go back to high school, yes. as, you, as you probably heard. Yes. And I don't know if I need to rehash the whole uh, story of the name again. It's... Uh, Printer's Inc. Yeah. Printers Inc. Yes, uh, the German translation for that. But yeah, that's that story's uh, become probably the most asked question of anyone, and deservedly so, of anyone in Druck Farben. But uh, you know, just the big steel drums in the rehearsal space that Ed and Troy mm-hmm. were rehearsing at in high school had Druck Farben written on them. But uh, we, we keep talking about, you know, we should drive by and see if that place is still there, but it hasn't come up yet. We really, it probably isn't there by now. I'll go sneak some pictures. That would be fantastic, you know. <laughs> and uh, so that's really where it starts. But when, when Troy is in Classic Albums Live, say 2006, 2007, and convinces them to do a couple of Yes albums, he, have co- he of course calls Ed Bernard, um, who was the guy. Ed Bernard had been in a, uh, the Yes tribute already at that point. Um, called Yes, I think it was called Yes Songs, but he had been doing that, and because of our conversations through working with Angelica, he gave me a call, and I remember that vividly, saying, oh, well, well, if we did a couple of Yes albums, would you want to play keyboards on it? And, he, and I answered, oh, yeah, sure, like that's going to happen, right? Forget that, you know, sure, it'd be nice. And when I got the call, Will, it's really going to happen. Oh, awesome, great. I remember vividly hanging up the phone going, oh, man, I got to... I gotta learn how to play this stuff. I, I've never played it. I don't know if I can play it. So, that 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 whole experience in, in the summer of 2007, the ten rehearsals toward that show, were like a, a master class for me for, for music. Um, working with this group of musicians who I'd ever met, um, never worked with before. Troy, that was my first time with him. Phil, I never worked with him. Uh, Jason Farrar on bass, Russell Gray on guitar. Just these James Gray, of course, uh, who I shared the late James Gray. I shared keyboard duties with it was just it forced me to up my game it forced me to work harder than I've ever had and uh, I came out the other side a completely different musician so it was a formative experience that whole yeah I'll never forget it uh, oh it's it's, it's yeah the, I uh, I can put myself on stage at the Phoenix that night September 20th 2007 I, I can be there right now and it's just an unbelievable I, I remember I remember vividly just starting the sample for Close to the Edge, just, you know, the waterfall effects, and just hearing the, the crowd, you know. I didn't know if I was going to get a crowd of people going, let's see what these guys can do. Not at all. Couldn't have been further from the truth. They are all on our side and just wanted to hear the music played. And the electricity was just, we couldn't do any, we couldn't go wrong after that point. The, the energy in the room was just unbelievable. So, yeah, fantastic night. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, well, we'll be right back with William Mack. Right after this uh, drink of beer. Absolutely.